<laughs> well, I will say okay. it's the friends that yeah. I still have followed on social media, and you are one of them. I feel privileged that you have oh. kept me along your journey because it has oh, been many, yeah. many years since we've seen each other. Um, yes. And Long you're time. doing so many exciting things that we're so excited to talk to you about. Um, yeah, yeah. I would love yeah. to start with your professional career, which has been incredible. If you want to give us a uh -huh. little background yeah, there. Sure, absolutely. So um, I'm a sex and relationship therapist. I'm a, uh, a, I'm a certified sex therapist by the American Association of Sexuality Educators, Counselors, and Therapists, which is a very long that takes the breath out of me when I say that sometimes. ASECT, mm -hmm. basically, um, A-A-S-E-C-T. And so I got certified um, in February of 2020, right before COVID actually hit. Um, but I've been a psychotherapist for 13, 13 years now. Mm -hmm. And so I started my career working in community mental health, and I worked with um, adolescents, everyone from adolescents to geriatric people in community mental health, people that have, you know, mental health issues of concern, such as depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, some psychotic disorders I worked in. I worked at a, um, a psychiatric hospital for, for two years in my career. And then when I moved to DC in 2017, um, I worked in behavioral health administration and I didn't like it. I could push paper all day and supervise people and tell people what to do, but I didn't like it. And I really missed the clinical work. Mm -hmm. So I joined a group private practice. And what I did was, yeah, I moved to DC in September of 2017 after I finished my doctorate. So did all of that and went to DC and then joined a group private practice and did that for about three years. And then I came out and then I went out on my own. I actually opened my online practice right in the heart of COVID. Wow. Which was crazy, you know, um, but, but a lot a, of my probably clients. Probably a good time followed, to do yeah. it, honestly. Oh, yeah. I mean, people yeah. really needed help. And the good thing is, is that I was able to take most of my clients from the group practice because I was the only sex therapist there. Mm -hmm. So they were able to, to join with me. And so in my practice, um, which has really grown and I started out online and then I got office space in the Northern Virginia area because my husband and I were still living in DC. He works for the federal government. And so he does telework now, but um, I opened a practice in McLean, Virginia. And then, you know, we wanted to be in New York. I wanted to come back to New York for media opportunities. And so then we opened a practice up here, which is where I'm at right now. So I've got two, Thriving practices as a sex therapist. I specialize, I think, in everything. I see cisgender women, men, couples. Um, I see a lot of LGBTQ folks, a lot of people that practice just not monogamy, but consensual non-monogamy. I'm also a kink affirming therapist. So I see a lot of people that are in the BDSM community, people that have more than one partner, people that practice polyamory, meaning you know they've got more than one intimate partner. Um, which is, is great that people are, know that I specialize in that so they can come to me and talk about that. And so I do a lot of that work, but I also see people that have like, you know, issues with sex. So they could have erectile challenges, um, premature ejaculation, delayed ejaculation. A lot of women and vulva owners that I see have vaginismus, painful intercourse. So we talk a lot about that and ways to, to work on your body and to relax your body. And to know that sex is about pleasure and it's not about a performance, which so many people come into therapy thinking, what the hell's wrong with me? <laughs> There's, you know, masculine men come in and see me and say, I can't get an erection, but I can do everything else. And I'm like, well, look, this is actually quite common. Right. And it's probably because you're very anxious, but you need to check, check you know, check your testosterone levels and all that stuff to make sure you're okay. So I do a lot of that work and it's, it's great work. I like doing relationship therapy more than anything because I find relationships to be so fascinating and complicated at the same time. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot about my work and what I do. And of course I'm in the media and I do a lot of writing and podcasting and do a lot of that good stuff too. So I'm staying very busy. That's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, oh. your, your podcast, so you dedicated that to sex and chronic illness, which was yes, very intriguing right. to Jenny and I. We both yeah, suffer yeah. with chronic illness. Okay, um, yeah. Different yeah, kinds. Yeah. 
And, um, mm-hmm. you know, like I was telling her, I'm like, I just can't wait to prick her, pick her brain about, you know, women of a particular age with, you know, these certain issues that we're dealing with, you know, and just kind right. of, you know, yeah. get yeah. a little, yeah. little free session, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <just> like... <laughs> but yeah, I specialize in that too, chronic illness and sexuality. So helping people reclaim their sexuality after being diagnosed with a chronic illness. I see a lot of people that have different... Um, autoimmune diseases, uh, cancer survivors, um, you know, people that have a history of childhood illness and still have a lot of health anxiety and how that's caused a lot of, I see a lot of people, that's the other area of sexual low desire. People that have chronic illness can have low sexual desire. And so Mm -hmm. looking at sex differently, looking at what's possible instead of what was once achievable with sex and how people actually go through a grief process with chronic illness and how your body can change and all of those things. So I do a lot of that work, Um, which is a neat niche because a lot of sex therapists, they don't specialize in that. And so people, a lot of people come to me for those uh, various problems that they may be having. Um, And so I was diagnosed with Lyme disease in 2012. And so that's what really, Mm -hmm helped me because I thought, gosh, I mean, what's wrong with me? I had no idea until a neurologist diagnosed me and I was living in Williamsburg, Virginia. And I remember walking outside all the time, my apartment building, and I think I was bit by a tick and it must've been a little one because Mm -hmm. I didn't see it or anything, but I got deathly sick. And so I think personal experience and professional experience got me into working with chronically ill folks. And also being a geriatric psychotherapist, said people coming in with a lot of different various chronic pain conditions, but then younger people were coming in and seeing me and people were like, I'm not having sex. And I'm like, Ooh, let's talk about that. Yeah. So, (laughs) which is a big part of our lives. Right. Mm -hmm. So I kind of got interested in that. So that also did that. Yeah. That's really great. Really great. Yeah. Yeah. Jenny, you want to, you want to throw a, throw a hard ball at Dr. Lee? What do you, what do you got? Uh, I, I don't think <laughs> through my head. You go. You go. <laughs> I, listen, I have pages here, okay? So I have, yeah, I have yeah. to fire yeah. away. I'll just interject. I have, yeah, just it. tell me, hey, just, no, I have tons uh, of stuff. So uh, something that I thought was would be really great for our audience, again, we're women of a particular age. You know, yeah. there's a lot of things going on socially. Um, you mentioned the LGBTQ plus population community. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, what Jenny and I are both pretty passionate about is bringing more understanding and education to people. Um, I have three daughters. Um, They're 25, 18, and 16. And let me tell you, they're quite excited that I'm doing this interview. (laughs) And (laughs) that says a lot about, you know, young people are so open and, and just fluid and, um, compassionate and empathetic. I mean, it's just so cool to see this next generation, but, you know, I definitely want to maybe get some understanding from you for our listeners Mm -hmm. about especially gender norms and gender roles. And, you know, we're hearing a lot of talk right now about pronouns and, you know, I think the the young people are having a much easier time Yes, going, they are. you know what? I'm going to try this out and that out and do this and that. Yep. And they're Absolutely. totally fine with it. Yeah. And we're over here like, are. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I'm not sure. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> so, you know, I think a lot of it's just not understanding, you know, what, what all of this means. Right. You know, you're absolutely right. I think we're seeing the younger generations definitely come out younger and they're more mm-hmm. accepting and, they're creative and, you know, I'm going to go by they. I go by they, them pronouns. Oh, cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or I'm pansexual. Okay, great. Or I'm pangender, you know, pansexual means you're attracted to all genders. Pangender is you identify being all genders or or specific types of genders. But in our generation, especially the Gen X and then the baby boomer and everything else, we don't see that because of the way that we were raised and how things were ingrained in us. So when we hear it, it's like, what, what do you mean? What? Cause when we yeah. were growing up in good old Chesapeake, Virginia, mm-hmm. you, <laughs> if you were gay, if you were, if you said you were bisexual, it was like, no, you're not, you're one or the other. Or yeah. 
if you were gay growing up, it was very, very difficult, which it, it was for me, but mm-hmm. I broke down the fucking door at the age of 16 in Western Branch and yep. people were like, okay, you're gay. So if you're gay, that's okay. And then I became popular and did Grease and was in the mm-hmm. Mr. Western Branch pageant. So a lot of things changed then, but still back then it was it was really tough because it just wasn't talked about no. or it was taboo or it was wrong. Now we're seeing a shift. We're seeing parents that are more sex positive now, which is great. Absolutely. Where everything was sex negative. And, you know, when you went to sex ed, it was like, if you have sex, you're going to get pregnant or you're You're going to die. (laughs) You're going to die. Don't do that. Look at these. Look at them. (laughs) (laughs) The gift that keeps on giving, they don't go away. And and then of course, you know, if you're gay, that's wrong. And it's a sin and you're going to what? You're going to die of AIDS. You're going to catch AIDS. You can't do that. Right. Because when the AIDS epidemic hit, it wiped out so many people. And so there was still the stereotype that if you're gay, you're going to die of AIDS. And now we see, gosh, we see medications that you can take like PrEP to prevent HIV. We see people who are taking their sexual health seriously. If you're Mm -hmm. on a dating app, you can list everything that's going on with you, which is great, right? I mean, you can tell people your status. You have these wonderful, lovely cell phones now where you can have just your 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 health record on it so if you're gonna have sex it's like okay i'm negative or i'm positive and this is what's going on with me and so i think we're trying to destigmatize hiv and aids and we still have a long way to go with that too but we're seeing where gosh if you're hiv positive you can take one pill where back in the day you took 20. Right. So we've, and, we've really come far, I think, with a lot of things. Yeah. Oh, of course. And, you know, but what I think what we're seeing, too, now, like you just said, it's all about we're talking about it. You know, it, these things are not it, right? in the dark somewhere in the shadows. We're exactly. communicating. Partners are talking to each other. Pa- like you said, parents and children. And, you know, yeah. it it changes. It, it just gives more information, gives more life. You know, it changes those things. And I think that a lot of the stigmas that we grew up with, and I'm, tell me if I'm wrong, Mm -hmm. I feel like that definitely we carry that into our adult sexual life. Oh my gosh, of course. As far as I think I've come, you know, there's still those things where I'm like, ooh, I'm like ashamed to share certain things or or embarrassed at times or, you know, whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's ingrained in us. It's how mm-hmm. we're raised. It comes from the attachment style that we got from our parents, where if you were born in a family dynamic where you don't talk about your feelings and you just don't talk about emotions. Well, when you grow up, you're going to do the same damn thing. You're not going to talk about your emotions or you don't know how to talk about your emotions. Or if you grew up in a family where it's so enmeshed, it's like, you stick by me, you don't go anywhere, you don't do this, you don't do that. You're also gonna grow up and not do it because you're gonna, if I do that, I'm gonna have so much shame. Mm -hmm. So I don't talk about my sexuality or my gender because I was always told that, you know, don't go there. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing younger people do it because I think we are seeing more parents that are curious and that are using sex positivity. And so children can feel more safe, but if they can't feel safe at home, they're able to go to their peers now or their teachers and social workers at schools who can help them navigate this. I have parents come into therapy all the time that I'm seeing them for couples therapy and they'll come in and say, oh my gosh, Dr. Lee, my my son just came out as trans. I don't know anything about this. Help me understand. Mm -hmm. Or my daughter just came out as pansexual. What does that mean? Because I've never even heard that word. So a lot of it is education. And I think having these amazing conversations is what's needed. And now we're seeing that. And that's why we're seeing a shift. Absolutely. um, And everything. Um, So yeah, yeah. Do you want me to tell you about my transgender journey? (laughs) I would, whenever you're ready. Shots because, fired. because you know, that. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go for now, it. Now, what is the difference between, say, pansexual and bisexual? Because ah, the classic, the classic yes. question. I've been lectured yeah. to the hilt about this by my 16 year old daughter who has come out as pansexual. They have okay. allowed me to talk about this. No, in fact, they've encouraged okay. me to talk about them. So, Good. just, just so you know, and my middle daughter is a lesbian and. Um, my oldest daughter is 
well, right now she became a mother and she has a, a man in her life, but <laughs> okay. you never know. Yeah. So yes, yeah. I have the yeah. same question as Jenny. It's a little confusing right. to me. Yeah. yeah, it can be confusing. Well, I think the thing that we also have to look at is that gender and sexuality is very fluid now. Okay. Where back in the day, it wasn't. It was like you were, is, you had, you were, you were put into a box. Mm-hmm. You're gay, you're straight, you're bi. Yeah. Or you're not even bi, right? You're either gay or you're straight. Now we're not seeing that. We're seeing people say, you know, I may one minute like a woman and then I like a guy and that's okay. The way that I understand it is that pansexuality is defined of being attracted to all genders. So if you want to, women, men, gay men, lesbian women, transgender men, transgender women, people who are non-binary where they don't identify male or female or they're on the spectrum of both, which is also, we all we hear an older term that comes out, gender queer, mm-hmm. that we hear too. So my understanding is you are just like, oh. love, you, love, you love everything about the damn rainbow every single day. <laughs> You are every a very flavor. every every flavor, <laughs> every single flavor. Where bisexuality, when you hear bi, too, right? So I think it's more. Usually, it's it's being I think sexually attracted to men and women, right? Mm-hmm. Cis men, cis women, but it could also be transgender women and trans men. It could also be you're attracted to lesbian women and straight women. Mm -hmm. So it's really, when you think about it, it's kind of in a way the same thing, but pan is like everything. We're bisexual. I think we think of it through a more narrow lens. Like it, like maybe it depends on the individual. It depends on the individual. That's it. I like that you say that because I think it depends on what you like and what you want. Okay. You can be say, I'm bisexual and I'm attracted to these different people or I'm pansexual and I'm attracted to these different people. So really, when you think about it, it's the same thing. Kind Mm -hmm. of like, you know, we were born with the same parts and they're designed differently. Right. You know, it's like you're, you're fit into these categories. Like who the hell decided that girls have to like pink and boys like blue? Who really gives a shit when you think about it? Who, who society did that? Right. And isn't that like more gender norms versus gender, your sex, yeah. your assigned sex at birth? Like that's right. confusing too, yeah. I think, to people. Yeah, I think it is too. I think gender is an expression of who you are. Orientation is what you're attracted to and mm-hmm. who you are and what you're born as. So cisgender meaning you agree with the sex that you were born as. So a cisgender woman, a cisgender male where a trans woman and a trans male, male, they disagree with what they were born with and they transition, right? Mm -hmm. Or some trans folks believe that they were never really born that way. They just have that part, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that's really the difference between those two. And I think that's what's important to understand is that people confuse gender and orientation sometimes and they're different things, right? I mean, you can be... um, a trans woman and date women and still be attracted to women. And you were never really thought of as, or your orientation is gay or queer. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, um, we see Caitlyn Jenner I'm who was with Chris that, Jenner yeah. for years and Caitlyn Jenner, she transitioned in late in her sixties yeah. and repressed it for so damn long and is actually in a relationship with another trans woman. Yeah. It was absolutely beautiful. Yeah. I mean, you know, she has her own skincare line and, you know, I mean, just a, a very beautiful woman. And so it's fascinating. That's why mm-hmm. I, I went into this profession because it's so fascinating and it's always changing. Yeah. Which and that I think was so good. huge, Caitlin. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, everybody's like, wait, what? You were in the Olympic. What? I mean, it like, it, yeah. I think it made it more. I don't know what the Accepted. word I'm looking for. Accept it more credible or something. Yeah. Credible, credible, you know, but yeah. um, because that was a celebrity that, that, that came out and now we're seeing more trans celebrities. We're seeing more trans folks in film and 
mm-hmm. who are using platforms, um, which I think is great. You know, we've got, we had Angelica Ross, who is the first black trans woman to be in a musical on Broadway in Chicago, which I thought was incredible. So we're seeing a big change. And, you know, that leads me to say that when I was a child, I never felt like a man. Never. I didn't like boys. I didn't like boy toys. I always liked the dolls. I always liked the colors. I loved pink. I remember being, um, I think I was maybe seven and I was in the grocery store with my mother and I saw this Barbie doll and I said, I want that doll. And she said, you can't have that. And I said, why? And she said, because boys don't play with that. And I said, well, and I remember being seven and I think I said, well, that's stupid. I'm like, who, who cares? And she said, you can't, she said, you can't have it. And I said, I want it. And she said, you cannot have that doll and we're leaving right now. And I said, no, we're not. And I remember lying on the aisle and I pitched a fit and I kicked my legs in the air and I started screaming and crying. I said, I want the doll. And she was like, fine. And she like grabbed it. And I was so happy. I was like, oh my gosh, she gave me the doll. This is great. I've got this beautiful Barbie doll. And, you know, I never just imagined myself as a a boy, you know? Mm -hmm. And when I was a child, I was a very pretty child. I had blonde hair and blue eyes. And I remember everyone just coming up to my parents saying, oh, you have such a beautiful little girl. And my mother was like, he's a boy. And then my Mm -hmm. dad would just go with it. He was like, thank you. You know, yeah. I mean, he, was, he was actually chill about it. She was the one that, that wasn't, she was wow. the one that, the opposite. Yeah. you know, I had a fit about it. Um, but I'll never forget. There was one time I just got done playing with my, you know, my girlfriends. I played with girls in the neighborhood growing up and I came home and I had these like, it may have been like those pink jelly bracelets we had way back in the day. Mm-hmm. You know, and I had a bunch of them on me. I had like pink and purple and I come home. And I remember one day my father looking at me and he goes, you know, when are you going to be a boy? Oh. And I went right now. And I remember taking the damn things off and I threw them in the trash. And I think that is the minute I repressed my gender. Okay. All the way from being a gay male, identifying as a gay man, you know, to now. And just coming out as trans very recently Mm -hmm. um, because it ignited something in me. I think I repressed it all of my life until last month. And it's funny when I came out to my, one of my mentors, who's a fabulous sex and relationship therapist, and she's been one for over 30 years. She said, you know, Lee, when I met you in 2016, you didn't wear makeup. You didn't really do much to your hair. Your body even looked different. You didn't do your nails. She's like, I honestly think that you've been transitioning mm. and you just haven't really realized it. And it's like mm. this like freaking light bulb just went off and it wow. was wild and this awakening and, you know, walking down Park Avenue here and seeing a beautiful woman one day walk by me. And I was like, that's me. That's who I am. Wow. And then just finally owning it and coming out to my husband. And when I came out to my husband, he was pretty much like, well, I'm glad you're finally saying this because I thought it and, you know, everyone else thought it and I've always known it. And so now it's just time to own it. And I'm really, I'm really proud of it. I'm really looking forward to the next steps, which will be hormone replacement therapy, which I think I start in two weeks. I meet with my doctor and then I will start that process. And become like this new beautiful person that I know that I've always been. And I've just shoved it, shoved her way deep down and into the, the abyss of things. And now she can finally be who she wants to be. And I'm starting that process. And it's so interesting. Psychologically, I'm already thinking about different relationships and the way that I see things and view things. And it's wild. It's just, I can imagine. Yeah. It's just so wild. And, and just, I can share this because I think people wouldn't mind and my husband doesn't care. My husband and I are not monogamous. We're not monogamous. We came out as polyamorous like a few years ago. Um, We were in a very, um, very uh, foundational, tight knit monogamous relationship. And I came out to him and I said, you know, why don't we just try this? And he said, well, I'm glad you're 
saying something because I'm curious about it too, where a lot of gay male couples are very open, Mm -hmm. very, especially sexually, Mm -hmm. but we decided that we wanted to do this. And so being non-monogamous, I think even helps it more because if he wants to be with a masculine man, he can. Mm -hmm. And if I want to be with a masculine man, I can. Or if we both, let me tell you something. My husband and I love pansexual men. It would be great to date a pansexual man. Like we, I'm on the pansexual hunt. So if you know a very masculine, put together pansexual man, bring him my way because I will, I will eat him up. Like for dinner. I will be on the lookout. But currently, I am swimming in women. They're everywhere. We're everywhere. Okay. Well, you gotta. Well, if you if you decide to swim in the man pond a little bit and you you take a dive, I will dive be on the prowl. Yep. Yep. So you know, I mean, we we have that ability to do that. And what's very funny is that you know we're on different apps, and I've come out as trans on my dating apps. And man, the attention that I'm getting is like really insane. Like how much men love trans women, like. Straight I, men. I, I see that. I really it's, do. It's, it's there. The thing that we have to realize is that there, and this is going to sound confusing to some listeners, but it's very important to point out. There are men that have sex with men and don't consider themselves gay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Meaning that they like the eroticism part of it. They like the sex piece, but they don't want to put themselves into a box and they don't want to identify as gay because maybe they're not emotionally attached to a man. Mm-hmm. And there are women that will do that with women. That's why we're saying things have become so fluid. But I've been getting a lot of attention from very masculine, good-looking men on apps. And it's funny. I'll show my husband, and he gets jealous. He's like, that guy is hot, and you're getting that attention. But they're not into me because I'm not trans or femme, and here you're (laughs) getting it. But then I'll get on his app every once in a while, which is called Scruff, because my husband is bald and bearded. And I won't get any attention, but he gets eaten up. So it's so funny to watch the people that are attracted to both of us. Right. And I feel like it's just made our marriage stronger being who we are and him just loving me who, who for who I am and just being so open. My husband was out on a date all day today and I get to go home and actually hear about it tonight Wow! with a younger guy and he, they've got this daddy son thing. They're kind of looking at the guys <laughs> like in his younger thirties and my husband's 41 and I'm talking to this like really hot 23 year old that has this mommy son thing that he wants to have with me. So I am just eating it all up. I'm, I'm living a great life, people. Let me tell you something. Listen, more power to you. I think it's incredible. Exactly. I don't think I could handle it personally. I, I know my husband couldn't. No way. We it's have hard. Our, listen, we have our my hall passes, couldn't. but. <laughs> It's hard though. It's not easy. And let me tell you something. When we first became polyamorous, I wanted to close things up because I got jealous. Yeah. And I tell my clients, don't go into polyamory thinking you won't get jealous because you will. And let me tell you something, honey, you need a Google calendar. Make sure you're putting everything on your Google calendar. Make sure you're communicating. You don't want any (laughs) run-ins. You you can get a run-in here and there. And, um, it's just, it's great. It's great. And we're so secure that that's why we can do it. If we weren't secure. Oh yeah, person, you have to be. You, want it. you both have to want it. And well, so and we both have wanted this. Yeah. I think I love that you, it not just you personally, but you and your work. It's like, the bottom line is that everything is okay. You know, whatever works for you personally right. and as a couple is okay. It's okay to embrace those things, you know. Like I have a hard time watching that sister wives show, you know, Mm -hmm. every time I turn it on, I'm like, I don't know, but my oldest daughter, she loves it and she's like down with it. And I'm like, all right, you know, so I've been trying to like, so it's just, yeah, it's trying to change our minds around the the norms and society. And not that I have to do what you're doing, but just being able to have respect and empathy and compassion for people and, you know, embrace it. And you know what? I think if we had more of that, we would have a better world. If people (laughs) could just understand where people come from and who they are. And and you bring up a good point because you don't have to do it. You don't even really have to agree with it. It's validating. When you validate someone, you don't have to agree with them. You're just validating the world that they're experiencing. Okay. You like 
you like this and I like that. That's okay. I'm happy for you. I'm so glad that you're secure in your marriage Mm -hmm. and you can date who you want to date and be who you want to be. And I think there's something very powerful about that. I think it would be nice if people could receive more education on that and want to know about it instead of like judging it or saying it's wrong when you don't it's know like, that's about not it. needed you know we we it's just, not need it yeah yeah don't, I, I love don't, that validation don't. is the perfect way to say it right and clean up your own backyard before you step in mine no uh-huh. <laughs> like don't judge me until you've looked at yourself because apparently you've got some things going on with you that you have to address right so oh yeah I, I think that's important it's nice when you can And I think that's why I do well in my practice, because I have a shame-free, judgment-free, sex-positive environment where people can be themselves and talk about what's going on with them and holding that space. If they're coming out as trans, gay, queer, bi, non-monogamous, kinky, whatever that is, to be able to hold space for that. And that's the beauty of therapy. Yeah. You know, we... My my two younger girls... Well, all three of them have had therapy throughout their life, but... um, you know, we had to find a new therapist for my two mm-hmm. younger ones. I Right now, my 16-year-old's the only one at home. My 18-year-old went off to school, so uh-huh. which I'm super yeah. excited for her. It's great. Uh-huh. But, um, it's great. So she's still on the hunt. But it was funny because they're both looking on their own for therapists. And my youngest, Abby, when she found the one that we just we just recently went to the first appointment, and she was like, I found one. She is... Um, uh, LGBTQ plus friendly. It, like she had checked like every box and like made sure. And it was just, I just love that they're so, oh, and they're so open to therapy. I mean, they, yeah. they, they tell their friends, me and Jenny have talked about this before, like us growing yeah. up, if you were going to a therapist, it was like, you wacko. What do you, what's wrong oh, with you? Oh yeah. That's okay. <laughs> let's normalize, let's normalize mental health. Right. Absolutely. Like, like we were like, that. Yeah. Anybody, you know, and yeah. my girls are well, like, sorry, I have a yeah. therapy appointment. Peace. See you later. You know, like, I know. <laughs> I, I love it. I love it. And I'm glad you're sharing that because I think, um, When I moved to New York City at 18 to pursue acting and dance, I had moved back home to Chesapeake a few years later because I didn't like my school. I got cast in a film. The film fell through. I sprained my ankle in a Broadway audition. I was like, I'm going home. (laughs) And I I went back to Chesapeake. So you can only imagine I left New York City and went back to Western Branch. Oh, my Mm. gosh. And I get back and I went to a therapist and it was the worst experience. I walked in and he was like, what can I do for you? And I was like, not a damn thing. I like, <laughs> I'm out. I'm out. I got home and I was like, I will never go to therapy. Why do people go to therapy? Yeah. You know, and here I am a therapist. Right. So I love that people are doing more of it and it's helpful. And it's, people are telling you, you know, I can't make it to dinner with you at five o'clock cause I have therapy, but yeah. I'll see you like tomorrow. Mm-hmm. I love it. I think it's great to normalize it because guess what? We live in a crazy world and I, I, I don't like to use the word crazy, but I guess I am using it. It's, <laughs> it's, it's just, a, you know, it's, it's a very uh, interesting time right now and there's a mm-hmm. lot going on. And I think that people are realizing that they need to go get some help and it's okay Absolutely. to do it. And the pandemic, you know, up the ante, you know, for oh, yeah. regarding mental health, especially for our kids and our young people, but for right. everyone, I'm, you know, um, but yeah, you know, I think it's, it's helped just help them kind of own, it's helped them with their sexuality. It's helped them with their body image, you know, issues. Um, you know, it's funny. Cause when you were talking about your childhood and, you know, feeling, not feeling like a boy and, you know, my middle daughter is very masculine mm-hmm. and she still identifies as she, her, you know, she, she's, mm-hmm. a, she's gay, but She's very masculine. And from the, I think the last time she wore a dress, I can almost remember it like it was yesterday. It was school picture yeah. day. And she put on a dress for school picture day. This was, I believe, third grade. And I want to say maybe even second grade. But she wore tennis shoes with it. But everybody made a big deal about the dress when she went to uh-huh. school. Oh, it's so pretty. You look so pretty. She came home that day from school and she was like, no more dresses. That's it. And that was it. <laughs> there was no more dresses and she i had done, to yeah. literally shop she would only wear boys clothing 
So she wanted like the basketball shorts and like t-shirts, but it couldn't even be girl fit. Like the boys fits and the girls fit, you know, they fit mm-hmm. differently. Mm-hmm. She mm-hmm. didn't like things restrictive on her body or clingy or, you know, now my youngest daughter kind of went through a phase like that too, but it was less about the masculine cause she's way feminine, but she just was trying to figure out her body. You know, they go through that awkward stage, you know, and whatever. And the girl's clothes always fit really tight, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. But I had to, I I did draw the line when she asked me to buy her the boy underwear when she was little. And looking Mm -hmm. back on that, I feel bad because now I do buy her the boxers and the men's underwear. But, you know, I, I hadn't really paid too close attention to it but then I noticed she was having a hard time in the last few years when she's shopping for shirts and you know, it has a lot to do with her chest, you know, and how mm-hmm. she, so it's like, I'm trying and sh- I think she's trying to figure it out as she's going, of you know, course. but of let course me tell she you, is. Yeah. her father and I are so open with these kids and we have been so accepting of them. But when she finally came out, which we were all same thing, kind of sitting around like, <laughs> when is it going to come on? She was scared to death to tell us. And I said, Georgia, we've always been, we've embraced you, but it was still very scary for her, you know? And I thought, I can't imagine what it's like for a child in a different kind of home. Oh, it's so hard. It's so hard. And that's why, um, you know, they need help. I, I actually started seeing adolescents again in therapy and I, it's like I'm never seeing teens again because sometimes the parents and <laughs> the systems lot. that you mm-hmm. it's a lot, but man, they need it more than ever right now too. Everyone okay. does, but teens are really if they're growing up in a home where it's not welcomed and you don't talk about it and it's concert like very conservative mm-hmm. and you know, it's hard for them. So they really need it. Um it's just really hard. There's this really cool organization called Trans Santa where you can actually donate gifts to trans youth. Oh wow. Who don't have the support. Like if they need clothes, if they need just, you know, hygiene products, you can send them. If they want music, you can buy them gifts and you can send them things. Oh, and I just wow. Yeah. My goal one day hopefully is to really I mean, if I ever do charity, God, I hope one day I can. I will so just do something for LGBTQ youth. It's a very special place in my heart because I experienced that growing up, but I look at these other children from other homes and that can't live the lives that they want to live. And, you know, I have to tell you, when I came out as trans last month, the first thing I thought about was not me. I thought about other disenfranchised, marginalized people other than myself, because I have to tell you, I have a lot of privilege. I'm white. Mm -hmm. I come to an office every day and shut my door and see my clients who are LGBTQ or other people. I don't have to transition in front of a bunch of people in an organization. Right. You know, I have a very supportive sex therapy community, but I'm not this woman on the street who's black, who's trans, and she doesn't have the resources that I have. And so those are the first, that's the first thing I thought about because I'm like, gosh, can you imagine being black or another person of color and not having the resources and being queer and then coming out as trans. I mean, it's just very hard. But then again, I do live in an amazing city yeah. that does offer so many resources. But if you're and progressive, someone yeah. and progressive, right? But if you're someone in a different part of our country and you don't have those resources, it's really hard. And so I'm glad that now we have something like telehealth and telemedicine Mm -hmm. to where people can reach out and do that. That is one thing about COVID that really changes the way that we do healthcare, the way that we do, you know, health and and therapy and things of that nature. I mean, it's still, I see a lot of people in person now, but I just do see a lot of people online, Yeah, which is great. Um, Absolutely. You have to be licensed in the state, Mm -hmm. but still, I mean, you can... There's some lead way with it that goes on, but no, I think it, I think we need to help more folks who are marginalized that don't have the resources that other people do. Yeah. And you're right. I mean, here in Florida, we have a lot of, lot of conversations here in Florida about, oh, you know, I know. especially children right now I and know. in schools yeah. and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard for us to wrap our heads around, you know, I, I just want to say, you know, as the mom of, you know, 
a gay young person who is masculine, even though she doesn't identify as, you know, he, him, the fear mm -hmm. that I live in, especially in this state, it's overwhelming at times, you know, and yeah. I will say that I've been so, again, I agree with you about the privilege. You're, you're making a perfect point because she is more protected and she, yeah, she right, has right. had, you know, she, thank God, you know, she has, but it is scary, you know, all the it time. Is, and yeah. I'm scared for all our children, you know, no matter what they identify as. It's I a know, scary yeah. freaking time yeah. to be a kid <laughs> right now. It you is, know? it is, <laughs> right. And I think it's scary to, to just, to be a kid and to have those feelings and know who you are, but also so empowering to know who you mm -hmm. are at that age now. Like when I see children and adolescents come out is trans or queer or gay, lesbian or bisexual or however they want to identify. I think it's very empowering too to know who they are. You know, in the state of Virginia, we have the governor who's trying to pass things that you can't be who you want to be in school and you have to go by the gender that you're born with. And yeah, that's what kills me is that when people just don't want to understand it, they'll never get it. But you think about it. I mean, can you imagine being born in a body that you don't agree with? I mean, Thank God, I'm glad I did repress it because I wasn't even aware of it. Uh, no, <laughs> you know, yeah, like, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's not great, but thank God that I was able to repress it for so long. But you see these children who know they're like, "This is not me," and the fact that I have to wear this, or the fact that I have to put this on, or I have to go by my dead name. Yeah, meaning you know that I have to go by the name that I'm born with when I don't agree with it. Lee is also very gender neutral. Yeah. Which, uh, <laughs> like woo, thank God, girl. I just got some luck, honey. I got the I got the luck. I got the luck. You don't see a big Adam's apple either. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, but there you go. To me, I don't know. I know there's a lot more research too that's been done. So there's science yeah. backing up what's happening here. You know, I'm sure you could elaborate a little more on that, but it's there is biological things happening in trans people that definitely point to why they're feeling the way they're they are it's not and just why environment and why they're trans i mean i'm telling you i think that uh, hey look i was born with a penis and i can tell you one thing that's the only thing if you if that that made me male mm -hmm. because the voice the looks as a child you know i get on the phone now with people and they don't know who I am. They're like, all right, ma'am, you have a good night. I'm like, you too. They don't. It's like, you know, it's, yeah, I'm like, okay, yay. Because, right? I mean, it just, it was always like that. And I remember you, know, you I as a young, young yeah. person. Like, you were, you yes. would gravitate to us girls. You were around the girls. You, you were one of the girls. Right. Like, I mean, and I remember you being embraced yeah. as such, you know, like by the girls anyway. Yeah, I was. I, I, I have to say, you know, it wasn't really that bad. I mean, people were young and kids can be mean and there were jokes. And mm -hmm. I really think a lot of people were joking to motivate me to come out. I think it was yeah. more of a, come on, let's pick on you. Let's call you Liette or Leanne instead of Lee. So you can just do it. And then I did it. And it was like, all right, you know? Yeah. So I think that's why I want to be a voice for younger people because it has changed and we're seeing things go in a great direction, but it's still very hard depending on where you're living, mm -hmm. the environment that you're in. It's just very difficult for a lot of people. And we still have to be very careful. Yes, I live in Manhattan in a beautiful neighborhood, but as a trans woman, you bet your ass, I'm still careful where I look and where I move mm -hmm. and where I go. Mm -hmm. You have to be safe. You have to know your surroundings and where you're at at all times. So there's people out there who still hate people and we have to be careful. I mean, gosh, they arrested two men here not too long ago that were going to go into synagogues and blow them up. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing something with anti-Semitism right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually converting to reform Judaism. So it's just, oh, you're really, you're really going I, full. <laughs> man, I got a lot. Hey, Hey, y'all, I got, y'all, I got a lot going on right now. Okay? You're bringing the heat. You are bringing the smoke. I am, I am bringing mind. the heat. Queer <laughs> trans Jew sex therapist. Why not? I need my own reaction. Get show. after it. You. <laughs> I'm going to have it one day. Gosh. Oh, you know, I mean, God, 
I need to call Andy Cohen and tell him I want to be on Bravo. I've been trying to like. Oh my yes. gosh! Yeah. Make sure you give us. Yeah, a I'm trying. My publicist <laughs> says I need to be the first trans Royal Housewife of New York. I would love it. Mm-hmm. I would do it. Oh my second. god, that would be incredible. Yeah. They need to have a trans housewife or yeah. queer. We need to change things up a little bit now, right? So. Absolutely. We're doing that. And let me tell you something. The franchise needs it. It would be more interesting. That's for damn sure. But I just saw um what's oh my god, I'm gonna Dylan Mulvaney. Am I saying that right? She has a big following on yes. do you know on TikTok is where I keep mm-hmm. seeing her and she's a trans yeah. woman. I and love, she her, love her, her, journey. her journey. Yes, shared and journey. Kathy yeah. Hilton just did like a thing with her with like they were doing Christmas PJs and yes. cookie decorating. Yeah. And, and I thought yeah. that was really, really awesome because these women, yeah. and there was a couple more involved. I'm, I don't, I have not dove into the real housewives. Jenny has brought me on to the bachelor uh, nation kick. So I'm working on that slowly. I love reality TV. I just never got into the housewives, but I just thought that was so cool that these women yeah, yeah. were embracing well, her. Well, there was uh, on Bravo back in the day, well, not too, too long ago, there was the Million Dollar Matchmaker, right? Mm-hmm. Series that was on with Patty Stanger. Okay. And I, what day was it? Tuesday? I auditioned for the Poly Matchmaker, mm. where I help couples open up their relationship. Oh, wow. And the producer said, why would you be great for this? And I said, oh my God, what's not to love? I'm humorous. I'm fun. <laughs> I shoot straight from the hip. I'm like a lot like Patty, like a queer trans Patty. And he right. went, queer trans Patty. That's kind of funny when you say that. Um, <laughs> and he, <laughs> and he great. ate that. He like ate it up, you know? So we'll see. He's like, I'm going to take this back to my people and show it to them. So we're seeing things become more normalized. And I think the fact that they would do like a poly matchmaker show is fabulous. That's, that would yeah. be so intriguing. And, Ooh, and don't yeah. forget, don't forget the honestly unfiltered podcast when it happens. Cause it's going to happen. Yes. You see things mm-hmm. happening for you. You, oh. you are just moving in such a great direction. I'm working on it. I'm trying, I'm trying to break down barriers so people can be who they want to be. And it's fun. It's fun. You have to love what you do. You have to love who you are. And I think there's something special about that. And I really try to have my clients do that, to have self-compassion, to have self-love, to be who they want to be. Because when you are who you want to be, you've got great things that come for you. And it's not easy, but it's a journey. And we're all on a journey in life. And you have to embrace that journey. And it's not easy, but... Mm -hmm. You know, I've got a lot of uncertainty coming my way. I'm like hormones. What, what's gonna? You know, I talk to I'm, trans I'm women. Be and I talk to... for you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> for real. This is not easy. That's another thing people. No. I don't think fully wrap their heads around. This is not some mm-hmm. quick, easy. You know, flick of the wrist thing. I'm not this gonna is... flick my wrist yeah. and be. Yeah, this, this is, is a is journey. This is very you know? intense. Yeah. It you go through a lot. This these you are not flipping decisions that people are making just for fun. I got laser you know? hair removal for the yeah. first time yesterday. I do yeah. laser now. And oh my gosh, it was like, <laughs> like shocks to the body. I'm like, damn, you know, I mean, this is intense. And the mm-hmm. woman who was fabulous, she was like, I can do, I can lower it. I'm like, you got to lower it. Shit yeah. <laughs> I've heard it's really painful. Yeah. I haven't done it yet. But she said, you know, you don't have a lot of hair. So that's great because it's going to go away fast. And then estrogen is going to help it. So but I talk to people that take estrogen, you know, and a lot of my trans patients and colleagues who are trans are like, your face is going to, oh, you're going to love it. You're going to get soft and you're going to, you know, get some things added to you and it's going to be fun. And so I'm looking forward to the fun things and the challenging things will come, but that's okay. you got to try to embrace that and work through that. And that's why it's important to have a support system. I always tell my, ask my clients in therapy, who's your support system outside of therapy? You've got to have that, whether it's Mm an online support group or or an in-person support group, right? Who do you go to for that? I think we have to have that. And I have to have it too. It's just not my husband and my parents. It's a community. It's, It's also my clients coming out to my clients has been amazing. They're all supportive. They're just like, do it. They're excited about watching me change in front of them. Are you kidding me? They're like excited about it as just as I am. But there is fear and there's scariness and things to consider for surgery and, and what do I want to do and how it's going to look and mm-hmm. how invasive it can be. And 
There's a lot of options. I definitely know who I want for to do my breasts. Let me tell you, he's fabulous. <laughs> Dr. Barrett in Beverly Hills is the trans breast augmentation king. He's fabulous. Wow. So I will be going out to lovely Los Angeles for my beautiful breasts one day once I've done HRT for a good number of years. So that's a journey in itself. I mean, yeah. you just don't transition like that. I mean, it's like the, it takes years to transition. Years. Absolutely. You know, I feel like Caitlyn Jenner though was like that. <laughs> it seemed like <laughs> that, like that, but like she might have I, been in the process for quite a long time before mm-hmm. she came right, out. right. And I also think it also just depends on your body. Like some people could experience things fairly quickly, you know. So it just depends on who you are and your genes and where you're from and what you're doing. So yeah. and the support that you have, I think it's the resources and also the support. Yeah, the reason I think financially too, it's like yeah. how, oh my gosh, you know, because these things are so expensive. That's another thing that people, yeah. you know, it's like the more resources financially you have, I'm sure the faster that process goes. You know, exactly. That's the other piece, right? If you've got the financial means, then yeah, okay, you're doing hormones, you're doing what you do, and that's why I think it's important to help others that don't and to be there for them. Absolutely. And I think again, we really do need more trans psychotherapists out there. So I love that I'm going to be able to contribute to that and to see more trans people in therapy. But also I see, I see more heterosexual couples in therapy more than anything. And I think it's because just the differences in male and female sexuality between yeah. cisgender heterosexual folks, the different levels of sexual desire that people have. So there's a lot of that, you know, but it's, <laughs> it's imagine. great work. It's it, yeah. Right. And sometimes it's not the female partner that has lower sexual desire. She has higher sexual desire than her male partner. So it just depends. And if relationships change over time, sex is going to change. Our bodies change. Marriage is not always easy. It takes a lot of work. It's a lot of Mm -hmm. spending that time with each other and reigniting things when it needs to happen. But that's why people come to therapy. And that's, what's great about it is that they can learn how to do that. Jenny and I always talk about the cruel joke of, you know, when I was in my 20s, my husband wanted to have sex four times a day. And I was like, get away from me, Satan. (laughs) Like, because I was in my childbearing years. And, you know, and then it switches. Women hit their sexual prime later. And then they do always over there sitting there like, Jesus Christ, I'm tired, lady. Leave me alone. (laughs) Right? Like, I got to do this again, (laughs) you know? Because when men have an orgasm, if we're talking about cisgender het men, and, you know, cis, well, penis owners, really, you know, you have a refractory <laughs> period where you have to kind of, you know, women, yeah. vulva owners, you can have one, multiple or none. And sometimes it takes longer to get there. Yeah. And it takes, we have to talk about the clitoris. I mean, come on. The clitoris <laughs> is the, the amazing organ in the body that's made for pleasure. Yes. That wishbone looking organ is amazing. So the clitoris is where the pleasure is at. I have a lot of women that come in or vulva owners and say, you know, my partner thinks they're getting me off through penetrative sex, but we have to realize a baby has to come out of there. So the nerve endings are in the clitoris. So feel free to use a toy. I was just interviewed by Teen Vogue. Teen Vogue. Wow. Wow. On the best silent, quiet sex toys. Wow. That you can use. That's and great, I tell though. You, yeah. Isn't that great? Talk yeah. about pushing barriers and opening things up more. Teen Vogue interviewed me, and there's this brand called Cute Little Fuckers. <laughs> and it was created by a gender nonconforming person, and they created this. And there's these little gadgets. They look like little beetles. There's this one that looks like a little bug, mm-hmm. and you put it on the clitoris and it rests there and it doesn't make a noise. It's wow. Amazing. Wow. Incognito. Toys, back in the day, these sex toys looked like giant penises. They were terrifying. <laughs> yes, they are terrifying. <laughs> like why the hell would I want to use something like that? That yeah. looks that scary. You know, <laughs> it's funny. I dated this guy back in 2005 and I bought this double dong dildo. <laughs> And I showed it to him and I bring it home and I got it in this bag and I'm like, look, I want to use this on each other. And he <laughs> looked at that thing like he was terrified. Like, oh my God, kill me now. Like, kill me now. Like, what the hell, right? 
they were scary back in the day. Yeah. But now you've got these cute little toys, these little gadgets that don't even look like penises that are fabulous. Well, and I think for women, young women, to Teen Vogue, that's so cool because yeah. how many young girls, especially teenage girls, they feel they don't understand and the boys understand less than the girls. And I'm talking about straight sex, you know, heterosex between, you know, a, a, a boy and a girl. Yeah. But, you know, I think and I listen, I'm guilty. I have a hard time talking to my girls, not about sex, but about yeah. like self pleasure. You know, it's always been a right. little taboo. Like I'm like, mm. I know they talk to each other. <laughs> I know yeah, that's sure. lazy. I'm letting it. Right. But yeah, I, thankfully they have each other, you know, sister wise and stuff. But, um, you know, it, I think it's important for young men and women for everyone, yes. but especially mm -hmm. women to know it is normal. It's normal for you to do. It's OK. And I think it'll take the pressure off of them feeling like they have to hurry up and have sex because they're like have physical intercourse. Mm -hmm. I don't think they learn. They, it is changing. They're learning at a younger age. So, you know, it is, it is but. changing. It, it definitely is changing. And I think it's great that it's okay to say it is perfectly fine to masturbate and touch yourself because it's pleasure and the body is made for it. And masturbation or solo sex, it serves so many great benefits from having pain, pain relief, stress relief, to have energy, to have that lovely feel good chemical oxytocin released. I mean, it's great to do it. I have like, seen I have a patients. few studies about pain. Yeah. Especially. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I have a lot of patients that have chronic migraines and they will masturbate to help relieve back pain and migraines hmm. and to distract them. Let me focus. Sex is actually one great thing to feel alive when you're battling mm -hmm. a chronic illness. It's like the thing to do that brings you pleasure, right? Right. And people don't think about that when they're battling something or they are in pain, but other than just mindfulness meditation, having a good orgasm can, <laughs> can go a long way. <laughs> can go a long way, right? You know, Absolutely. and then of course, knowing that sex is not always about an orgasm because we have people that that have different medical conditions or disabilities that can't achieve orgasm and that's okay, but you can still have pleasure. I was interviewed by another journalist on erogenous zones in our bodies, that the skin is the largest sex organ. There's so much that you can do to receive pleasure and it's not all about the genitals. Yeah. That's a good point to make. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Cause it yeah. does change. Absolutely. It does change. So let's normalize sexuality people. I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I could go on and go on and on. Right. Listen. I mean, there's just so many yeah. things I know. out there. You've been incredible yeah. with just, I, it, this is exactly what I was hoping for. I'm so excited yeah. for you. I feel like, you yeah. know, we've been able to educate, you know, and I hope to continue with you in the future. I would love yeah. for you to come back to us. Of course. Whenever you want. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd love to. Yes. Yeah, so I'd we love can to. share in that journey with you. It's so exciting. Yeah. 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 It's so funny. I've been neglecting my own podcast to be on other ones. So I guess I need to hop <laughs> on mine in December and try to knock out two episodes or something, but I love doing this. I think it, it just needs to be put out there and to normalize mm -hmm. things about sexuality and gender more than anything and know that there is help out there and you can live the life that you want to live by getting the support that's needed. And for folks who want to spice up their sex life, that's why sex therapy is great. Sex therapy is a form of talk therapy mm -hmm. where you come in and you talk about your sexual challenges and get some help on how to address them. Absolutely. And it's very powerful work. There's a lot that you can actually do. Sexuality is just as important as our mental health. So mm -hmm. I always say that. I so agree. I agree stuff. with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Anything you'd like to add, Jenny, before we go? No, I think we've covered it all. Yeah. Yeah. Good. It's exciting. Well, yeah, it's all exciting stuff. Thanks for having me. And, Absolutely. You know, just let me know. Um, you know, and when this episode comes out, I will actually share it all over Thank you. my social media awesome. as well. So we'll put it out there. So. And we'll definitely, and I would love, Jenny, it would be really great if, what was the organization you told us about for the trans? Yeah, I it's. Yeah, I would love to post that because I do, there is, now, is this, are these homeless 
trans youth or are they some of them not homeless but just need certain things that they can't get from home? Um, it is. Because I know there's a lot of um, homeless um, charities and stuff yeah. too for trans youth that, well, for LGBTQ all over. Right. I think, I think that this organization is, um, let's see, it is for trans youth that are really, um, you know, struggling with being trans, homeless, homes that aren't supportive. It's for, it's for all trans youth. Okay. So, you know, it's definitely something to, to look at and I think to help out with. So it's good stuff. Love it. I love that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, thank you for having me. So keep in touch and yeah, I can Will come do. back on again anytime Will. you need me. All right, guys. It's been a pleasure. Take care. Take care. I've been busy today. Absolutely. Like Thanks. Bye. Eight people. <laughs>